You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome back to Mind Over Murder. We're so happy that you can join us for the second part of our discussion with Mark Olshaker, co-author with legendary FBI profiler John Douglas of the incredibly successful Mindhunter series of books. Their latest is called When a Killer Calls, a haunting story of murder, criminal profiling, and justice in a small town. When we join this second part of the conversation... Mark is telling Kristen Dilley and I about different cases and how they impacted the two of them, both John Douglas as a profiler and for Mark Olshaker and John Douglas as writing partners. We return to the interview as he is discussing the John Benet Ramsey case. Thanks for listening to Mind Over Murder. Circling back to the one case in that book that John was involved in and that I was involved in too, the John Benet Ramsey murder. Uh, mm-hmm. That was a case where we couldn't say what happened exactly. We thought we knew approximately, but we could say, we can say with confidence what didn't happen. What didn't happen was that the neither of the parents were involved in killing this little girl. It's still controversial to this day. I think the case was 1996 and People are still talking about it today and still maligning us for what they think we got wrong in it. I had a, I, I had a debate with, a, with a, another investigator recently who claimed that he was convinced from the psycholinguistic analysis of the ransom note that the brother had killed her with an unintentionally strong blow to the head and that the psycholinguistic analysis of the ransom note showed that the parents had staged this to look like a kidnapping attempt. And I said, okay, I don't agree with the psycholinguistic analysis. I think it shows something else. But assuming you're right about that, just tell me one thing. Where's the bitter hard enough to cause a, a seven and a half inch crack in her skull? And we know it would have had to have happened in the house. Show me where the blood was. Was that Jim Fitzgerald you were talking to? No, actually. I'll just tell you, it was not an FBI agent. We've debated this with a number of FBI agents. I think a lot of people have come over to our point of view now, but when it first came out, we were vilified and John was vilified within the Bureau for coming out the way he was, the way he did. Other FBI agents, as you well know, came out on the other side. You're always taking a risk when you do these things. The other cases, which I think are very memorable for another reason, are both the West Memphis yep. 3 case. Right, and, and back in the, the news uh, now. And what most people call the Amanda Knox case, although mm-hmm. it really is the Meredith Kircher murder case in Perugia, Italy, both of which we covered in our book, Law and Disorder. The reason those cases were important is because we realized after John got out of the Bureau, that he wasn't just limited and we didn't have to just use profiling to help catch the bad guys. We could also use it to analyze cases and exonerate people who we thought had been wrongly accused and in some cases convicted. The West Memphis Three, I won't go into too much detail about the case because it's another book, but three people with three young 17 and 18 year old boys were sentenced to life in prison and one was sentenced to death for killing three eight year old boys. There was absolutely no evidence, we thought. And so it was a horrifying case. And the same with Amanda Knox and her then boyfriend, Italian boyfriend, Raphael Selecito. According to the prosecution's case, They came to this crime scene the next morning after killing this young woman so brutally and somehow with a mop and bleach cleaned up all of their own invisible DNA from the crime scene Mm -hmm. and left only the third killer, in this case, the only killer, Rudy Gaudet's DNA. 
I said to both of them individually, to both Raphael and Amanda, I said, if you could have done that, you deserve the Nobel Prize in chemistry, impossible. It does bring up another point, which is very important and a very important theme that we came across, which is that when the story that's put out, whether it's put out by the media, by the prosecution, even by the defense or whatever, when the story is better than the evidence, better than what actually happened, evidence often doesn't have much of a chance. I can't tell you how many times I have discussed the, the Kircher murder and gone through all of the logic, all of the evidence, all of the behavioral evidence, all of the scientific and forensic evidence, and had people say, yeah, I see what you're saying, but I still think she was involved. <laughs> that we're living in a, a non-truth environment today. I keep bringing up, I don't know if either one of you are old enough to remember the John Wayne and James Stewart movie, Western movie classic, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valley. It's an important movie for John Ford, Western, very mm -hmm. prominent. But what's interesting is, and I hope I'm not giving anything away, <laughs> but James Stewart, who is this mild-mannered lawyer, makes his whole career from being known as the man who shot Liberty Valley, this horrible outlaw who was terrorizing this Western town. In fact, even though he confronted Liberty Valance, John Wayne was the one who actually shot him. So at the end of the movie, James Stewart is telling this whole story to the newspaper editor. And then he says, so are you going to, are you going to print what really happened? And the editor said, this is the West, sir. When the legend becomes the truth, print the legend. And that's just, that's <laughs> wow. something I say all the time because yeah. it really is true. If the story is so much better than the evidence. What's a better, in, in the Perugia case, what's a better story? This beautiful girl and her equally good-looking boyfriend get into this drug craze, satanic ritual murder, sex ritual, and stab her repeatedly, and then go off and smoke dope afterwards, or that somebody broke into an apartment and was surprised by the girl who was there and stabbed her to death. I can tell you what's a better story from a novelist's point of view. It just happens <laughs> not to be true. Right. <laughs> but it was a story that the prosecution seized on and ran with. And because of that, this boy and girl were young adults, were in prison for four years before they were finally exonerated. Yeah. In the case of the West Memphis Three, they were in prison for 18 years before we were able to get them. Are you guys following what's going on recently with the West Memphis Three case with the new evidence? We've been really surprised by that case all along because we thought once they were sprung from prison, even though they, had, they didn't get exonerated, they were just let out, which we thought was a deal with the devil that the prosecutor made just so that they mm -hmm. wouldn't be sued for false imprisonment. We really thought that case would be resolved relatively quickly. And all these years later, it hadn't been. We keep hearing about new evidence. We keep hearing about new suspects. We obviously have some selections of our own, but I don't know whether these three will get justice and the three boys who were murdered and their families will get justice or not. You may have heard more recently than I have, Kristen. I haven't heard anything more recently than just a couple of days ago from Mara Leverett about they're still in this process of trying to get the evidence yeah. tested. It, it's such a shame and it's such a horrible case. And you've got to feel for all the families involved, too, that yeah. those three little boys will never get justice. It's awful. It's just heartbreaking. Absolutely. So that's really what we try to do. We talk about the quest for justice, as you all and particularly Bill know, there's no such thing as perfect justice. So we can't once somebody is murdered, we can't balance the scales. We can only do to the extent that human justice can make something happen. And that's what we try to do. At the same time, try to put these people away so that they can't do it to anybody else. One of the, in the grim ledger of justice, I think the Sherry Smith case, the Deborah May Helmick case that we talked about in When the Killer Calls, even though there were two deaths, and probably two other murders attributed to this one individual. This was in some ways a success story because yeah. he was caught within a month of Sherry's murder. Right. There's no question in our minds that he would have gone on to kill others. In fact, we believe yeah. he was planning another murder at the time that he was apprehended. Again, as I say, in the grim ledger of this kind of thing, this was a success story. Mark, I think it's fair to say at this point that you and John are two of the most respected writers and writing teams in the true crime genre. 
So how has this writing affected you on a personal level? If How different would your life be if you had not gotten involved in true crime? That's a very interesting question because I had been a novelist before that, and I'd been a documentary filmmaker, although none of my work prior to this NOVA program about serial killers and the FBI had been about crime. As a novelist and also as a documentary filmmaker, I was very interested, as all of us are in this field, in what we casually call, and Kristen, from her perspective as a as an educator, call the human condition. In other words, why do people do the things that they do? We all have the same emotions and the same emotional experiences, whether it's love or hate or jealousy or resentment or revenge or feelings of inadequacy or grandiosity or whatever. We all have those feelings, but most of us are able to keep them in check, to not go overboard with them. True crime writing really is about the human condition writ large, the human condition at the extremes. That's why it's so interesting in a way. And I think that's why it's also popular because people really do want to understand why do people do the things they do. I think that as difficult as it is in a way to have to live these people's lives vicariously, I have learned a lot about why people do the things they do about human behavior. And we can't discount the mystery element of it. People want to know what, as we said before, what happens next, why people Mm -hmm. do what they do. There's this great line in, I don't I'm so far removed from school at this point, Kristen, that I don't know (laughs) what kids read at what level. But I remember, I guess I was in college when I first read All the King's Men, the classic American novel by Robert Penn Warren. There's a line in the book that says something like, the end of man is to know. And he doesn't know whether what he's looking for is going to lead to triumph or ruin. But the end of man is to know. I think we all want to know, and I think that's the heart of mysteries. We feel like we have to know, we do want to know what happens next. And so along with giving a sense of what this range of people is like, from the evil of the perpetrators to the sometimes the good and sometimes saintliness of the victims and the people who try to help, whether they're in the police, the courts, the victim witness units, whatever, I think we see the entire range, the entire expanse of the human condition in these books. I guess that's why so many of the classic stories, and I guess I'm thinking of Dostoevsky to a certain extent here, Mm -hmm. are really about crime in one way or another. You all have been around, you've been mainstays in the true crime genre for the last two and a half decades, but it's really only been within the last couple of years that there's been this true crime explosion or the true crime renaissance where suddenly it seems like it's everybody's habit, everybody's favorite thing to read about. What do you think accounts for the fact that all of a sudden everybody is into I think it's a lot of the things that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. It's a way to live these things vicariously. It's entertaining in the sense that we solve mysteries. It's enlightening in the sense that we get to learn about people. But you're my control case, Kristen. You're a well-educated and I presume well-adjusted English teacher. What made you interested? First of all, it's, it was y'all's first book. It was Mindhunter. So I can blame the two of you and I can blame Patricia <laughs> Cornwell as well because I was reading Patricia Cornwell way mm-hmm. too early. But really, I think largely my exposure to true crime is also, it's the Colonial Parkway murders case that I was exposed to very early and the homicide of a friend of mine. And actually, I wrote a letter to John explaining the case and saying, I still have some questions about what happened. Can you answer those for me? Yeah, that's, it was a combination of I'm interested in this, but also I've lived adjacent to it. Let me ask Bill, let me turn the tables on you for a minute, Bill, and ask you. One of the things that several of the homicide survivor families have said to me is that they don't have the kind of fear and anxiety they used to in life. And the reason for that is very simple and direct, because the worst thing that could happen has already happened. So I'm wondering from your experience, how has, is your life different and has this increased or decreased your interest in pursuing this subject? Because I know you're still very interested in solving mysteries. 
Boy, that's a really good question. (laughs) Now I feel like I'm being interviewed. First of all, Kristen and my relationship, which stretches back now, where are we, about six years? Initially, it was because of Kristen reaching out to me to talk to me about the Colonial Parkway murders. She was working on a book, which I hope she returns to in her copious free time. Not likely. (laughs) Called Battle Scars, which was about survivors of homicide. And I still think it's a really interesting topic. And I know Kristen to be a fine writer. I hope that she's able to return to that book at some point. That's our connection. I actually find that for a lot of people that we've met who are in the true crime space, a tremendous number of them have been touched in some way by these tragedies. As I am fond of saying on Mind Over Murder, there are 200,000 cold case murders in the United States, and that number is probably conservative. There are potentially millions of us out there that have been touched by this. I consider myself a happy person, a pretty joyful person, a person who thinks positively most of the time. I actually disagree with one thing, which is that I can think of worse things that could happen, and I don't even think I want to verbalize what they might be. But these are all independent events. We could lose other family members, et cetera, et cetera. That's true. That's true. in, In a way that I think might be as equally painful as I was losing my younger sister, Kathy. It's funny, some of this for me ties into things that my, my mom said. She passed away about 16 years ago now. She was very Irish, ultimately had a, a dark worldview. And I remember throughout our entire lives as kids, four kids in this close Irish Catholic family, we were always pushing against my mom's endless worries. My mom was the biggest worry wart ever. She was always concerned about something happening, particularly as we got to be teenagers, that we'd go out in the Buick station wagon and crack up the car because there was an inch of snow on the ground or but bad things happened. And we were constantly pushing back against that. Oh, mom, it's not so bad. We'll be careful. We won't drink and drive. There are going to be kids at the dance. We'll watch out for one another, whatever it was. And ultimately, my mom's endless fears about things that were out there lurking in the darkness, as usual with moms, I have to admit now, all these years later, that my mother was right, that there are terrible things out there in the darkness. I think we should all try to find ways to get out there and enjoy our lives and be joyful and happy and challenge ourselves. Maybe that means we have to spend some time out there in the dark, but At the same time, I can't get around the fact that after all these years, it turns out my mom, Evelyn, was right. Very well said. And living your life in spite of all is a real tribute to you and your family and all of the people that I've dealt with who've been touched by this. And in that, I include the detectives and crime solvers, too, because I can tell you everybody who was involved with the cases in When a Killer Calls went through the same trauma Mm -hmm. with the families. They were all affected. And the fact that you can still live your life and still find joy in things with the kind of things we deal with, I think, also speaks to the human condition. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. One of the reasons why I think Kristen and I hold investigators, profilers, forensics experts, now this whole field of investigative genetic genealogy, we just interviewed Barbara Ray Venter, who was amazing. I don't know that I have a well-protected enough heart to do this over and over again. Mm-mm. I have great admiration, and I know Kristen feels the same way, for everyone that's able to work in this field, because I'm not sure I could do that. All that being said, Kristen said to me, what happens when we solve the Colonial Parkway murders? Note the optimism. I'm pretty clear at this point, I'm not going to be able to put this thing down. We're just going to try to do part of what we're doing now, which is helping other families Mm -hmm. understand this process and how they can get through it and how they can be most effective advocates. I think that's so important, Bill. And I can tell you one of the aftermaths of of Sherry Smith's murder is that her parents did become advocates. Anyone, any parents or family members who were suffering from the murder of a child, they put themselves out for, they counseled them, they came to their trials, all kinds of things. 
Sherry's mother, unfortunately, passed away, but her father is still around, and Dawn is too. And they really put themselves out and made themselves available to the Lexington County Sheriff's Office for anybody who needed them. We found this over and over again. You mentioned the Suzanne Collins case. We also have the Stephanie Schmidt case that we've written about, two murders of beautiful young women who had their whole lot ahead of them. In both cases, their parents really became advocates Mm -hmm. for justice. And it's really poignant and inspiring. Absolutely. We want to make sure that we do talk to you about Bill's current favorite TV show, Mind Too, <laughs> yep. with which I know you are an integral part, and that is <laughs> the Mind Hunter TV series on Netflix. Are we going to get a third season? I guess the easiest way to answer that, or the most appropriate way to answer that, would be to say. <laughs> It's a mystery. Ah, okay. we, we don't know yet. We're hoping. We know that David Fincher, who created the series, came up with a five-season arc. So we're hoping we'll get a third season out of it. It depends on what he wants to do. I can tell you all the actors that I've talked to, Jonathan Groff, Holt McCallany, they're chomping at the bit. To wow. do it. We hope so. We're very, we, John and I are very happy with the series, even though they obviously took some liberties with the mm-hmm. characters of the profilers. It rings true in terms of what actually happened in terms of the development of the program, their, the profiling program, what their interaction with the killers and other predators, both in prison and the cases that they solved. So we're very happy with this and we hope it does continue. You've got all these great books. It's not like they lack for material to draw. Unfortunately, I think with crime is like wars. There's always going to be a lot of material to write. Mm -hmm. Sadly, Mm -hmm. in in that regard. No, it it can't be as good as the books, but it's actually so well done. I recognize that David Fincher has a lot on his plate and he's an intensely creative guy, but I'm just hoping that somehow, some way we can bring this back because honestly i'm thrilled when i look at the scripts and see a line that i wrote in the book that's that's actually made its way through the process yes i'm i'm thrilled with that for instance one of the case of the murder of mary Frances stoner which i titled in mindhunter everybody has a rock nobody actually Mm -hmm. said that it made sense in the in if you read the book, you'll see the context in which it made sense. I thought it was a good line. And then I can't remember whether it's Jonathan or Holt says, everybody's got a rock. So uh, <laughs> and you're like, I was, yes, I, was, I, was, I said, yes, you got it. You got it. <laughs> Very cool. So can you tell us what's next on the docket for you and John? Or do you have to keep it under wraps for a little bit? Seeing as how this book just came Match, out. John and I just met today to talk about that. We do have an idea for another sort of book that will cover a lot of cases. And we think it's finally time, just as we wrote The Anatomy of Motive, to explain what really motivates a criminal and show how different cases that seem very similar to each other, if you delve into the motive, are actually completely different and show a completely different. We think it's time to do the same kind of thing now with both modus operandi and signature and explain explain the difference between them and how that absolutely gives us insight into the personality of the unknown offender. So I think we want to do a book about modus operandi and signature And then in terms of the next book in the series uh, of The Killer's Shadow and When the Killer Calls, I think we want to do a book about the Robert Hansen case in Alaska. Wow. Yeah. Which is, as you might remember, is another case of reality of truth following fiction. You all remember when we were kids, we read that short story, The Most Dangerous Game, about a man who got tired of hunting big game. And so he decided he wanted to hunt humans. And that's exactly what Robert Hansen did in Alaska. That was a case that John testified in. And and that was the key to convincing a jury that this guy had done all of these, this guy who seemed like totally incapable of it. And that may be the next book we do in this series. Oh, very cool. Every year that I teach that story, I always tell kids, hey, there was a serial killer who actually did this. It it hooks them from minute one. one. I I don't know how many, I guess I read the story in elementary school or junior high school or something, and it's still a classic. That theme had become a mainstay in terms of B pictures and the idea of somebody going out and actually hunting human beings, the ultimate Mm -hmm. game. Yeah, exactly. 
I would, again, maintain that anybody who does that, certainly mentally ill, but takes so much planning, so much organization, so much forethought, and so much covering up, and so much ingenuity in in luring victims, Mm -hmm. that person is definitely sane and definitely bad news. I'm trying to picture this meeting that you said happened today (laughs) with John. Did you meet face-to-face? Yeah. Oh, uh, how unusual. We, I remember we, this. Yeah, we speak on the phone almost every day, but when we're doing something like this, it's so much easier when we can meet face to face without giving away too many secrets. We generally <laughs> meet at a neutral location about Not in halfway, your... halfway between us. Okay. Because I, I pictured you coming over and having coffee at one of your houses or something like that. So. Sometimes we do that, but it's easier if, with traffic the way it is these days. Before we let you go, I did want to switch gears and ask you a little bit about the pandemic. Other life, yes. <laughs> because yeah, I'd, that is very much your other life. I know that many of our listeners may not be aware of the fact that you did some work with writing about deadly diseases and germs and viruses, but you did do a book about it. Actually, yeah. you would have leave to tell all of us that you told us so <laughs> <laughs> when it came to the pandemic. <laughs> Tell us about your book about diseases and germs. In 2017, Dr. Michael Osterholm of the University of Minnesota, one of the world's foremost epidemiologists, we wrote a book called Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. We really tried to show that we talk about national security all the time, and we talk about terrorism, but this microbial threat is so much greater than any human threat we might face. And uh, we talked about what the world needed to do to prepare for a pandemic of of worldwide proportions. And I have to say, in a little bit of bragging, or I told you, the book came out in 2017, and our chapter on coronaviruses was called SARS and MERS, Harbingers of Things to Come. So I can't (laughs) say that we exactly predicted COVID-19, but it was certainly something that we thought had to be considered. And actually, Mike and I are now planning another book that we've got a contract for with the same publisher to talk about planning for the next pandemic, the one we're calling oh, God. the big one, based on what we've learned and what we haven't learned from, from this one. That's wow. terrifying. And if I can anticipate your next question, which <laughs> might, what does this have to do with crime? The answer is, I think they're both mysteries that can kill you, and they both scare <laughs> me, and they're both detective stories. This is high scientific drama and uh, trying to figure out what's killing people and how you go about it. They're both detective stories, medical detective and crime detective stories. Again, not to be too flippant about it, but you do have to have some humor in this subject. So I'm sex violence and pestilence is what I do. (laughs) I'm like the stable boy for the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Really? (laughs) (laughs) That needs to be a t-shirt. That's awesome. (laughs) So just out of curiosity, what do you think we need to learn from this pandemic to help us survive the next one? Can you give us like, what are three takeaways? I think we have to learn a couple of things. One thing we have to learn is that a lot of people keep criticizing the scientific establishment, but they were learning what was going on at the same time. It's the same thing as when a killer is on the loose and the public says, you got to catch this guy. You do. You, you have to learn. You have to build up evidence along the way. And we don't know everything when we start. The public has to understand that the scientific establishment in a lot of cases is building this train while it's already running on the tracks, Mm -hmm. trying to paint it at the same time. And that's very difficult. The other thing which I think we have to say is the one thing that Mike and I did not anticipate when we wrote Deadliest Enemy was that if there would be a major pandemic, that there would be so much pushback against the science, Mm -hmm. the cooperation I think the fact that we have this really wonderful set of vaccines and people don't want to take it or that they're wary about it, I just don't understand it. And I don't understand equating personal freedom with not cooperating in a communal setting. And I know, Kristen, you're right on the white hot center of this being mm-hmm. being in school. Yeah. I know we don't have any really good answers, but mm-hmm. it seems to me we should all want to work together on this rather than making it so divisive. When Mike and I talk about what we all have to do as, as communities and as a world, we don't necessarily think it's all going to happen. We just think, because I think we're somewhat cynical at this point, but we think that's what should happen for the best result. 
I can say that with some certainty that probably the greatest public health triumph, the greatest scientific gift to mankind was the elimination of smallpox from the face mm -hmm. of the earth, which happened in the 1960s and 70s. It happened for a couple of scientific reasons, one of which was that smallpox happens to be species specific. It only affects human beings. So even though there's some close animal diseases, there was no animal reservoir for it. So in other words, if you could eliminate it, the human population, you could eliminate it. And smallpox has been the scourge of history. Believe it or not, even in the 20th century, more people died from smallpox than all the wars put together, which is pretty staggering. The reason smallpox was finally eliminated in the early 1970s from the face of the earth is because there were two major powers in the world the United States and the Soviet Union. And even though they had fundamental differences and tremendous amount of conflict, they both agreed that eliminating smallpox was a really good thing to do. They both said it's a good thing to do for humanity. And once those two powers agreed, then it could happen. And it did happen. Today, with all the different countries in the world which exert power and all of the different conflicts and all of the different views of reality. I really wonder whether smallpox could be eliminated. Some that a public health effort undertaking of, of this level could really work. You all are too young and I'm too young actually to remember when polio was an absolute blight every year. Public institutions like swimming pools, movie theaters, even restaurants closed down when there were big polio outbreaks. Then we had these two miraculous vaccines, which people just lined up to get. I wonder if we'd had all of the kind of, I don't know what to call it, different views of reality now and the different political divisions. Then I don't know if we would have conquered polio if it happened today. I'm not sure. I have to say, I am so profoundly disappointed with our response to COVID. I have to agree with you. Now, I don't think any of us are old enough to remember this, but for example, my uncle Jim, who just passed away a couple of years ago, wonderful man, Jim was in a wheelchair and he suffered from polio as a young man. During the time that we knew him, he was married to my aunt Nancy. He started out using leg braces and then ultimately ended up in a wheelchair. He was an incredibly dynamic mm -hmm. guy. He was a banker. He was a hunter. He was an outdoorsman. He had seen had been available to him as a child. He would have completely different life. Exactly. Now he had a wonderful life and Jim was a fantastic guy. I can't say that he didn't live life to the fullest within the limitations of the sure. capabilities of his legs. And again, that's another kind of everyday heroism the sure. that we were talking about before. When I remember him telling us what it was like to have polio as a young man, because we were curious. At the same time, I remember as a kid growing up in the 60s, and we stood in line at the various places we lived all mm -hmm. over the country, and even out in Hawaii, my dad was a naval officer. I remember we'd stand in line, and we'd get all the vaccines. I don't remember a single objection. We just did it. Exactly. It exactly. was all part of a community-minded effort to eradicate these horrific and diseases. Our parents were so grateful. Yeah, because they remembered what it was like when they were kids, and people like my uncle Jim and other millions of other people had diseases and, like know, When polio. I see these anti vaccination movements, I think, do these people not know what it was like before? Apparently vaccine? not. Pick up a history no, book. It's staggering to me. Just, I don't understand when people don't act logically in their own best interest. One you, of the, if, another one of the mysteries of the human condition. If you don't yeah. want to be all kumbaya beer with the can't we all work <laughs> together, then do it for your own selfish interest. Yeah. It's amazing. Both my partner Pamela and I, we have family members that absolutely refuse to get the vaccine. By the way, these are family members now that I haven't seen in two years and I have no intention of seeing anytime soon unless Good we can you. find a way to get through this tunnel and get out to a brighter place. Yeah, but I, just like we've talked about the, the whole idea of when the story is better than the truth, people won't confront evidence or facts. It's very difficult to get to them. How do we convince you and John to come to CrimeCon and talk to us about all the yeah. amazing... Chris has been talking to me about this for years. I may break down at some point. And, and, <laughs> once, once COVID is behind us, maybe I'll show up. You guys would be hailed as heroes. It would be mm -hmm. insane. You'd probably get jumped by groupies. It would be amazing. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know that's if that's a, good or I'm bad, sure, I'm, Mark. I'm sure my wife would come and, and watch. <laughs> fend, <laughs> fend off. He's married. Yeah. Watch out. <laughs> This new book is wonderful. So give everybody the rundown on it, the title and everything else. It is called When a Killer Calls. The subhead is a haunting story of murder, criminal profiling, and justice in a small town by John Douglas and me. And I do recommend it, not because I wrote it, of course, because I wrote (laughs) it, but also because I think it's a really emotional, poignant story that tells us a lot about the criminal investigative process, the criminal justice process, and it shows people absolutely, some people at their worst and some people at their best in the worst moments of their lives. It is a spectacular book. I loved it. I will definitely read it again. At some point or another, when I get up to DC, I would like you and John to autograph it for me, please. You certainly so will. Join my library. Me <laughs> too. If you were a little, you were a little closer, Kristen, we'd make a house call. I told my mom I would take her to the Van Gogh interactive exhibit for her birthday. So I'm going to try to go up in March at some okay. point or another okay. to take her. I went. It's very interesting. I've heard. It's not the paintings, but it's an interesting experience. She really wanted to do it. Once I I told her about it, she was like, okay, that sounds great. But yeah, that's the next time I'll be in DC. Since we're on that subject, you really can learn a lot about the artist just by looking Mm -hmm. at his art. And John always says, by the same token, you learn a lot about the criminal by looking at his crimes. It's the same thing. It all comes down to all comes down to the human condition. I love it. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. We thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you for it. having me. It's great as always. And I'll talk to you again soon. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.